All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Brooke Edmonds, and I'm with Oregon State University Extension. I work with the Master Gardener program, and I've been putting together this webinar series. So I'm always really pleased with our speakers, but I'm definitely very pleased to have uh, Dr. Dana Sanchez join us today. Dana is an OSU Extension Service Wildlife Extension Specialist. She works for the College of Ag Sciences, and she's in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, she has a research program in addition to her extension work, and so her research explores relationships between native wild animals, large and small, and their habitats in the face of various disturbances. Dr. Sanchez also answers wildlife-related questions for our um, Ask an Expert program that many of you may have used, and she also works closely with master gardeners and provides training uh, for vertebrate species that are being caught um, acting as pests in our environment. So I know we've had her at some of our county trainings and so she's wonderful. And I'm really pleased to have her today to talk to us specifically on deer and do sort of a deep dive into deer and deer management. So at this time, we'll just give her just a minute or two here, a second or two here to share her screen and let her take it away. Um, we will be holding questions to the end. So it's our usual format where we'll enter those questions into Q&A and then we'll have time at the end to answer those questions. I will mute myself and let Dana unmute herself and we'll... All right. Is everybody able to see my, my slides there? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Welcome everybody. Thanks for choosing to spend some time with us and talking about deer today. I know that they are a species that everyone has mixed feelings about quite often. They're beautiful, but they can also cause some real problems. Um, I was not sure how widely we were going to have our audience, so I tried to go ahead and, and talk broadly about deer, uh, including what species we're talking about. And generally, um, I would say that we can break deer into to two different groups, a mule deer group um, and the white-tailed deer group. You can see the mule deer on, on my left here and the white-tailed buck. Okay. There are a whole bunch of subspecies. So depending on where you're listening from, uh, you may be encountering a, a mule deer, a black-tailed deer, a Colombian white-tailed deer, a coos deer. Uh, there's so many names for all these different subspecies. They're, they've really diversified uh, to fit the diversity of which they occur. Deer in general have been really closely tied to our human history um, across time as a source of food, materials, uh, economies, and we can't forget that they play really important roles in the ecological systems in which they're interacting uh, as eaters and also as food for other species. Today, I'm really going to focus on these, what we might call medium-sized deer. We, of course, have other uh, native members of the deer or cervid family here in the States, including both elk and moose. Uh, they have their own special issues that we might have, but we're going to stick to these guys. Um, there are also non-native deer species that folks have introduced uh, in various parts of the country, red deer, fallow deer, all kinds of different types of deer. But again, I'm going to stick to these native uh, species. So as Brooke mentioned, I do get to answer lots of inquiries about various human wildlife uh, conflicts that come about. And in general, whether we're talking about deer or moles or, or any other animals, uh, you would say that there's some general categories of when conflicts can creep in between humans and animals. And generally, it's when they start living with us or they occupy our structures. Um, a lot of conflict comes up when they eat things that we don't want them to. And I would say that deer might be the, the rock stars of that category. Uh, sometimes animals cause actual structural damage or loss. That can be structures like houses or equipments or our cars, things like that. And then the rare but very important ones not to forget are when animals actually pose a risk 
to human health. That may be direct, uh, as in an animal hitting on a, a human being or biting a human being, or indirect, such as through uh, ticks or diseases. So we put up a little poll here um, to see what kinds of conflicts you might be having with deer at this time. Um, we'll open. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm slacking on, on the job. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> Give me a second. Let me get this launched, folks. Uh, okay. So for our participants, you should see the poll there. Let's take a... 10 or 15 seconds and allow you to respond. This is also multiple choice, so you can choose more than one. You have to be careful about checking the email while, while these <laughs> while the webinars are going on. That's all right. Okay, so I'm seeing responses. Let's just take another 10 seconds, maybe. Okay. Still coming in, let's give folks more, more time. Still seeing my, my little bar fly across the screen. All right. Okay, well, I think we'll end that. And then um, can you see those results? I sure can, okay. okay. So it looks like most of you who responded, um, the big majority is that well, in landscaping plants. And then right behind that is that they're eating food crops and garden produce. Um, uh, quite a few less uh, actually occupying structures. They'll be interested to hear about that. Um, but then there's some, about 6% damaging production ag crops, um, about 13% causing structural damages, and actually a troubling 27% causing direct or indirect risk to human health. So we'll want to, I'm sure those will come up during our Q&A. But those are the types of conflicts that our, uh, all of us are currently encountering with deer. Now, I should have come out at the very beginning. Uh, usually when I talk with Brooks groups, I, I do this. I identify as a grown-up version of that critter-obsessed kid who used to sit out in the dirt and hide behind bushes and grass just so I could observe animals. And then I grew up and became a wildlife scientist. Um, and so now I kind of geek out in a little bit different way in terms of trying to understand, especially human wildlife conflicts from the ecological point of view for the animals themselves. And I like to get back to that basis. So let me geek out for just a moment and talk about habitat uh, as a biological definition and concept. And so habitat for an animal um, is some combination of biotic and abiotic or living and non-living factors in combinations that are necessary to produce these responses of being able to be there, being able to survive, and then ultimately the big agenda item is to reproduce healthy offspring by members of a particular species. So that is really important to keep in in mind because the title of our, our presentation, our, our gathering today was about darkly deer. And it's like, why are they so driven to do these things that we, ju we just discovered are causing all these conflicts with people from wherever they're sitting today? And it, it's because of what they're after. It's kind of their, their ecological agenda is, again, to get the best quality diet they can to achieve the highest nutritional uh, plane, as we say it. So they want to be in the best possible condition so that they can ultimately produce live, uh, very vigorous offspring that'll pass their genes down to the next generation. Deer are uh, what we call ruminant herbivores. So that, what that means is they've got the four chamber stomach. They require especially for their size and their ecology uh, forage with really high quality, highly digestible or the most digestible available nutrients. Um, diet seasonally, but a lot of that is driven by what the plants are doing. They will always opportunistically maximize the quality of their diets. So we have to be really cognizant of that that they are going to go after the best food they can possibly obtain. And uh, they breed in fall, 
they have spring births. Again, that ties back to food. The food agenda is they're having those babies just when mom can access the most nutritious, you know, spring, all the plants start putting on new growth. That new growth is not only tender, but it's the most nutritious. Um, they are long lived animals, and that is important when we think about managing the problem uh, that might arise with the, these big animals that are eating plants that we value. In really heavily harvested uh, populations, uh, an adult deer may only have two or three years to reproduce and can uh, complete its life cycle. They can live extremely long times. There are records of 20 plus year old deer most uh, likely don't even see half of that. But they are in the whole realm of wildlife, fairly long-lived animals. So in terms of a problem being there, just shooing them away for a little bit of time, it, it tends to be that they'll just come back. And then another really important thing for deer management is to be aware that they have a social structure in terms of how they use space. Uh, it's really amazing that the females have basically form clans, so their offspring of past years tend to settle in the, about the same neighborhood, shall we say, and then raise their own generations of offspring. When we get down to the point of deciding whether we need to reduce populations, as much as people socially don't like to think about removing mommies uh, and the females in the population, the structure of populations really demands that we think about that structure when we're making decisions about managing the number of animals on the landscape. So, what are the many, many ways we might know that we've got deer in, the, in our uh, presence? We see them. Uh, we may even see their beds or those little tamp down areas where they bed down overnight in the grass or in the duff. Uh, hoof prints, scat, pellets. Um, we might see the evidence of their feeding, the jagged torn surfaces on the stems. Um, Deer form and, and carry antlers, but one of their forms of damage is called horning. It's usually actually a marking uh, behavior that males carry out, not only to, to strip the, the uh, velvet off of their new set of antlers, but also they've got an amazing array of scent glands on their body, including on their foreheads, and that's a way of them kind of leaving email to other male deer about who's going to be the dominant buck in the area. And in general, uh, even when they stand on their hind legs, the damage that we might see from their browsing or their eating is usually about six feet uh, maximum. Over here uh, where we've got both deer and elk, we can kind of use that as a, as a measure of who exactly is doing the eating we're seeing. So here's some of the, the signature things I wanted to show you about deer. Uh, here's um, this is a bone clone. It's not a real skull, but I wanted to point out the fact that deer don't have upper incisors or, or eye teeth. And so what happens when they snap off the end of a branch or a twig is they kind of tear it. And that leads to these, uh, if you see in the bottom left, these kind of torn or ragged edges to the, the, um, the clipped off vegetation. And that can help us identify, especially in the lower branches, whether we're seeing deer damage versus other alternative eaters. Um, a really heavy browsing situation, if you see on this lower right, can lead to what we call a, a browse line or essentially hedging even of trees. So in terms of management, our first step always has to include assessment of the issue. Um, most of the problems stress are not those that involve health or safety concerns, but it's the first question we ask is if a human's health is in direct uh, danger, then that, that uh, Push, pushes us to think about going through different steps of management. 
in most cases, our deer uh, conflicts in our yards are more uh, on the, you know, the level of eating things, stomping things, um, damages like that. And it's really important for us to think about just how serious is that problem, because managing any problem does require our time, energy, and potentially financial or other resources. So we don't want to waste any of those on a problem that is not really a problem. So is a problem insignificant, tolerable, or beyond acceptable? And then the context in the urban and suburban areas, the context of how much space are those deer using and how many human territories, shall we say, how many ownership boundaries are involved in the issue and what is the social context of the humans in that area is a really uh, key and critical part of how that deer herd can be managed. And I also have a point here, is somebody actually feeding the deer? Because that is a factor that then changes the whole uh, context of the issue. Uh, talk about a super attractor. So, um, and in deer, and in, in, we generally know that the, the problem is likely to occur and reoccur if they've found a good source of food. So we have another quick poll here, uh, just asking you uh, for your own case, are your deer interactions or problems insignificant, tolerable, or beyond acceptable at this point? Okay, I belong to that poll and uh, we'll just take 10 or 15 seconds. Okay, just another five seconds. All right, great, thank you everybody. So we've got, that's an interesting distribution. We've got about 60% saying it's tolerable and then the other, the quarters on each end being insignificant and beyond acceptable. So a lot of diversity uh, of what folks are encountering right now. So having said that we've got different contexts to consider in de dealing with human deer conflict, uh, because they are beautiful and charismatic and just in general, most folks don't want to hurt animals. It frequently comes up, of why can't we just move them? I want them to be happy and healthy. I would just prefer that they do it somewhere else. And there are a whole laundry list of why when we move wild animals, regardless of what type they are, that they just don't really do well. Um, in deer case, uh, unless we move the entire family group, uh, we really wouldn't uh, have much of an impact. So if that's not an option, then the basic tactics, again, across species, but even including deer, is that we can try to anticipate from our, our knowledge, our history, asking the neighbors if we move to a new place, what are some of the problems? Trying to prevent the problem, anticipate it and prevent a problem from happening is always the best and probably cheapest, most efficacious way to deal with it. But most of us don't get a chance to do that. The most common uh, and probably the most effective over the long term is simply to block the animals from being able to do what you don't want them to do. Uh, then uh, we try to fall back on deterring them from doing what they're doing. And then the last situation is that we may have to work with state wildlife officials to start removing animals. And because, uh, as I just mentioned, translocating them, simply moving them to a new neighborhood isn't an option. Removal is lethal removal. So I think it's useful to remember what we're up against. Um, we've got hungry deer and their agenda is to be as healthy and as good condition as possible so that they can produce, produce these beautiful little fawns. Uh, safety matters too. So I mentioned at the beginning that deer play multiple ecological roles. One is that they're a base food for a whole lot of different ecological systems. There are lots of large, 
large to medium sized animals that would like to eat deer, uh, especially the fawns. So safety matters when you're trying to get a meal and our neighborhoods, uh, our activities, our dogs, our fences, ourselves, we tend to scare off a lot of those predators. So we and our plants are often a really perfect combination for the deer to come and eat in a place that they feel relatively safe. So I mentioned trying to prevent the conflict. Um, we can try exclusion or blocking those animals if we know that's going to be especially delicious and nutritious. Um, we can just keep them out before we even plant them. Another alternative that I'll talk a little bit more about is choosing plants that are native or already have learned through uh, ecological time how to tolerate or push away browsing animals uh, so that they can essentially tolerate some damage but also protect themselves from excessive damage. Uh, we have to look out for, you know, deer are, I told you, herbivores, so that means they eat plants, but they sure are opportunistic. Um, they will learn and they will teach their kids to eat bird seed, chicken seed, uh, amazing different types of things, down fruit, things that you think of as garbage or waste uh, may actually be deer food. And uh, I've got a little Eat at Joe's sign here. Once we invite them in, and feel a little bit safer to check out what else is available. And then finally, please don't ever deliberately feed or lure deer, either with food or mineral blocks. Uh, once they habituate to that again, they get pretty hooked on that feeling, and it's hard to, to break that habit. All right, so in search of the deer-proof plant, I noticed on the introductions, even on the chat, that people were saying they're eating even what they're supposed to not eat. And I wish I had a magic list of plants. Um, in general, because they are seeking those growth tips, the, the most tender, most digestible, most nutritional pieces of plants, things that have lots of armor or thorniness are going to be fairly safe. There are other plants that are essentially armor themselves with noxious chemicals. Uh, they may smell a little off to us, things like sagebrush uh, and lavender. They, there's some that we like, there's some we don't like, but that's to our noses, to the sensitive nose of a plant-eating animal. They're picking up the information that this plant not only smells pretty strong, it's probably not going to be very digestible. So there are some of those that are aromatically uh, able to defend themselves. And then um, finally, wherever you are, wherever you're listening from, your native plants to that region are the ones that learned in the arms race, shall we say, between the plant and the plant eater, how to tolerate a certain amount of damage and then start getting woodier or thornier or more chemical filled to put that that herbivore off. So really when we choose landscaping plants that have already had time to learn about regional deer over a long time period, over evolutionary time, those are going to be our best bets for making it in the long run. Sometimes we can use those or the better armed plants to protect a preferred plant. So I've seen some creative uh, solutions done here in the Corvallis area. Uh, if you can kind of hide that, that more tender, juicy plant in among plants that are, are thornier or more aromatically uh, off-putting to the deer, sometimes they can make it for a while. But if you think about what we do to our plants to try to encourage their survival and growth, we feed them, we water them, we give them the best of conditions. What we're doing is producing really highly nutritious deer food. So we just have to understand that even when we put some of these uh, fairly well-adapted deer-proof things, that they may still be something that a deer can either get over disliking or they'll learn which pieces of the plant are less noxious. I can tell you from experience that I've watched a doe teach her two twins 
uh, how to pull out my, my daffodils with her foot and her mouth and flip it over and then eat the very end of the bulb itself that didn't have as much chemical. So they can learn and they do observe and learn from their mothers about what to eat. So finally, um, you look for your local resources, your local nurseries, uh, even may know if you tell them what neighborhood you're in. Uh, for example, where I live here in Corvallis is known as like dear heaven and they're like, oh, you live there. Well, you, you better look at this list of plants. Look for those local uh, nursery uh, resources and your extension master gardeners. They are some great of resources in themselves. They've experienced it. All right, so returning to the, the other methods, blocking or excluding deer from something, I'm just going to say at the outset that uh, for a lot of reasons, including the dollar investments, if you need to truly exclude deer, we should probably try to keep that to the smallest possible area. It's going to cost a lot uh, to ex fully exclude deer from large areas. Uh, we may uh, use very high fences, try to go at least six and a half, maybe even eight feet. Keep slope in mind because deer, remember that dastardly part, they are well motivated. If there is a little slope to make an eight foot fence really six feet, they will find that spot. Uh, they will take advantage of that, including uh, electrical line outside the fence or as a top wire is one thing to, to keep in mind. Also deer, if there is a gap, probably six or eight inches at the bottom, I've seen deer belly crawl under fences. They can defeat a fence that way. They are very motivated to get to those things that you're protecting. Sometimes we're able to fall back on protecting individual plants, uh, either from being pulled out of the ground while they're very, very small, or from being horned um, as that marking behavior. And I'll just show you a couple shots here in my own neighborhood of things that have been effective. And again, this is a high deer area. Uh, we've got one neighbor that did a beautiful, uh, as well as very functional deer proof fence uh, and some caging for some individual shrubs. I got another neighbor who did this. Uh, the deer defeated that fence uh, in multiple places and have actually carved a new pathway in response to the fence. So now they've got a stomped area as well as deer uh, bed down in that green area just beyond the fence so you can see. Uh, this is another acquaintance who attempted to keep deer out of a garden area with bird netting and then it snowed and of course the fence was no longer a fence. Um, and we also want to avoid creating problem fences. Um, the, the main point being that we really only should be doing deer proof exclusion fencing in the smallest area that we have to. Uh, because animals, other wildlife, do need to pass through areas and the animals that are most vulnerable to getting literally hooked up on fences are the winter stressed animals, pregnant, the juveniles, um, and beyond the, these sorts of horrible uh, situations here, fences of different construction cause real problems for a whole lot of different other species of wildlife, including things like birds that don't see the wires, uh, things like that. So um, fencing is a great solution if selected and constructed with all of its needs and purposes in mind. Uh, for larger projects, like I mentioned, there are some really good resources out there. I've mentioned one here uh, that Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, that's a wildlife management agency from Montana, put something together. Uh, again, their emphasis is that total exclusion areas, one, are expensive and hard to build compared to others, and two, uh, trying to limit the size of that is probably the best option. So moving on deer completely, then the second tool on that list was deterring them. So that's essentially, if you see at the top of the slide, the challenge of convincing animals to not want what they want. 
uh, or to go hopefully somewhere like the neighbor's yard and want what they have more than what we have. A lot of these tools, the shock and awe tools, um, such as bangers, screamers, uh, propane cannons, those things can be effective in certain settings, but they tend not to be effective in human neighborhood settings because they may or may not shock the deer, but they will definitely shock the neighbors. Uh, so those we tend to use in more rural and agricultural settings. I've got information here specific to the state of Oregon. If you are in a more agricultural setting and you need to use some of the tools, uh, I would say a little bit more extreme types of shock and awe, uh, it is likely that your state, wherever you are, also has dual permissions uh, required between a, a fire marshal as well as your state wildlife biologist. And it's not just a permitting, there's also a, a chance that you can engage those folks in helping you, uh, not only with technical assistance, but also co-funding it and uh, technical expertise. For most of us, uh, deterrence is going, the shock and awe, we have to limit things like this water scarecrow. Uh, it can be very effective against, uh, we've got urban turkeys here all over the place, as well as deer, uh, geese are sometimes an issue, but this is a common tool used by folks who want to protect a, a relatively uh, limited spatial area from deer without putting up a big fence. Uh, they run about 80 or $90 in our local uh, stores here, um, and you may need a couple different ones to make sure you get total coverage because, again, the opportunistic hungry deer will be really good at figuring out that one area that isn't covered or protected. And I mentioned that they're, they're effective against multiple species. Keep in mind that that includes human beings. So you want to test these before you leave them out and deploy them because if you blast the Amazon delivery person or the meter reader, your neighbors, you're probably going to have more of a, a human conflict management problem and, and not so much the deer management problem anymore. Uh, you do have to maintain these. Again, deer, uh, you know, some people ask me, it's like, are they just so dastardly and smart? It's like, well, I guess if we were to give them an IQ test, they may not be the highest among wild animals, but they sure are persistent. Uh, and the, the first night, the battery hasn't recharged and the, the, the uh, scarecrow doesn't go off they'll come and eat everything to the ground. So you do have to uh, tend any of these tools. Another approach of deterrence is to try to make that wonderful, nutritious food taste or smell so obnoxious that they will choose to go elsewhere. Um, my concern with any sort of deterrence, whether it's taste or smell, is you know my goal is to not have my plant in the deer's mouth. So this is already uh, a situation where I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, this nice group of does and uh, fawn is actually a picture I snapped with my phone through my car window as I rolled backwards out of my garage one morning on my way to work. So these deer are clearly not at all disturbed by me, my very close proximity or anything else. Uh, if I had zoomed in a little bit closer, you could see that that one deer actually has a piece of the shrub that's not a very tasty one. Uh, I selected it for that reason, uh, and it's it's moving off. It's just they're like, oh, you know, maybe we'll try the next yard. Um, I didn't have any product out there. Uh, sometimes I do use those. What I've learned and many other folks have learned is that there are quite a few different commercial as well as make at home products. Uh, most of them require to stick to the leaf to either provide the smell or the bad taste. Um, here in Western Oregon, that can be a concern a good bit of the year because we get so much rain so frequently. And then when it's not raining, it's beautiful and sunny, which is also a challenge to keeping effective product on the surface of plants. So in most cases, whether it's for smell or taste, 
we do need to reapply products and again maintain that that form of protection uh, quite a few of these products, in fact, most of them lack rigorous scientific testing. So it's very difficult, even if you go to your master gardeners, to say which ones are proved to be the most effective. It's, it's a little bit of each of us is on a trial and error basis. Some of them work better. And I will also say that, again, remember the dastardly part of those hungry, persistent deer is they can habituate to an awful lot. So... Um, we do need to realize that we've got to rotate products. One thing is not going to be the be, a, you know, one time, do it, leave it, it's going to work forever sort of solution. You're going to need to reapply things up um, and keep that smell and taste landscape nasty. <laughs> and then finally, um, I had mentioned earlier that one solution that sometimes needs to be considered when deer numbers just reach uh, unacceptable levels, um, and especially if we've got an urban or suburban area where a herd, in the absence of natural predators, uh, taking shelter in our, our nice, safe human neighborhood, sometimes deer numbers can get really, really high to the point that people start hitting them more often with their cars, uh, getting injured that way, having human on dog or human on deer, face-to-face uh, -face dangerous encounters. Those can increase um, as deer numbers and density get up. Uh, we can also have those situations come up from year to year, potentially, if there's a really hard year and the deer are driven in areas and high densities that they wouldn't normally occur in. And if it gets to the point where animals need to be removed from the population, that's where you need to reach out for help. Um, your state wildlife management agency, and, and the names of these agencies vary. Here in Oregon, it's Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is pretty, you can probably find that on the online or in the telephone book easily. Some states have wildlife management under a Department of Environmental Quality or Department of Natural Resources. But you should uh, get familiar with which agency is your named state wildlife agency. And I guarantee you that you've got a regional or what we call a district wildlife biologist. They're going to be a, wildlife, a trained wildlife professional uh, who's educated and, and working at uh, the population level to manage both the health of the human populations and tolerance for the wild animals as well as the health and uh, perpetual conservation of those species. Deer are a little bit tricky because they are generally a game species, which is very valuable uh, for hunting and subsistence, but they can also be a nuisance species. So you'll want to engage these professionals um, immediately if the situation is uh, approaching that. There are actually some great guides to uh, co-management and communities uh, in, in suburban or urban uh, situations. And so your district biologist would be one of their first uh, calls in that situation. Um, there are going to be different approaches and tools, and that's really in the urban and suburban environments. Working with other human beings is going to be a key. No, no situation is going to be successfully resolved without well as the wild animals being managed for some common goals. Um, so again, deer are darling. They can be dastardly. Uh, I want to bring up one last piece here that deer, although they're herbivores, they certainly aren't going to chew on us. They can be habituated by, um, by getting access to easy meals. And that doesn't necessarily, that generally isn't them coming and eating your garden or eating your fruit or your yard, things like that. It's generally deliberate baiting with food, uh, corn, mineral blocks, things like that. And it's often done in a sense of people wanting to help the wild animals. And it really is something that we must discourage because it neither helps animals nor people, and it can actually lead to some very dangerous 
factors uh, in that when animals lose their fear of humans, and we are the ultimate mega predator, they should have some serious concerns about being too close to us um, and our movements. Once they seem to lose that fear of humans, the distance between our bodies <laughs> tends to decrease. They get closer and closer. Like you saw those deer that I, I took a picture of just those few feet from my car. Those deer are clearly not fully respecting that I'm a human and potentially going to come and chew on them. Um, in that case, we can actually start seeing competition between the deer and what they perceive to be their resource and us. And we may not be getting the full signal of what's going on for them in their head that uh, they are going to defend this space or this resource. And uh, that can lead to some really dangerous interactions uh, in, in shared habitats. So I do urge you to look out for that and, uh, and help manage our, our fellow human beings to avoid those sorts of situations. And I think with that, we can go ahead and start taking questions, Brooke. So as you're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as you're thinking of questions, remember you can put those in the, the Q&A box and we'll also be updating. Um, Dana shared a few resources and so I'll, I'll find those like that one from Montana about building fences for wildlife. So we'll pull those and we'll post those on the learn page as well. Um, so I had, I guess a few things that came up in my mind. Um, sure. It was pretty interesting, Dana, when you mentioned about um, that we're creating essentially a, a protected environment for deer and you had mentioned like dogs and that yeah. I didn't I didn't really think I would think that the deer would be afraid of our dogs but I guess we're maybe scaring away the cougars or, or whatever the you know mountain right. lions and so that was an interesting uh, twist of how we're looking at right. wildlife yeah. you know dogs and deer um Unfortunately, having quite a few vets for friends, uh, there are an awful lot of very unfortunate encounters when deer and dogs get close up together. Um, mm -hmm. Our dogs, you know, I love my dog. If you could see all my pictures here, you'd see, you know, uh, how much of a dog lover I am, too. Uh, but our dogs run into the world nose first, uh, usually with tremendous enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, and generally very few thoughts to uh, their their wolf origins. So they, they descended from wolves, but they've lost a lot of the sensibilities that, um, that their ancestors had. And that includes staying away from the feet, uh, potentially lethal kicks that deer can deliver. Um, that's how deer protect themselves once they're backed into a corner is they'll either rear up and stomp with their front feet or they will kick and that can be lethal, uh, lethally damaging to our dogs. Yeah, you see all those videos that go around social media of these interactions and there's that one where they have the back deck and they have the dog beds. Have you seen this picture? And there's a no. deer in the dog bed and you're like, oh my goodness. Um, That's so scary. It is scary. Um, so there's a, uh, one question here so far. So Terry has a question. Um, it sounds like there uh, was a fawn, a newborn fawn in her backyard. Oh, and wow. you would like to close off her yard. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any like insight, I guess, into that sort of like day to day of, you know, fawns, I guess, are sort of left in protected areas. And is there a time sure. of day when she can safely sort of close off her yard? Uh, well, we wouldn't want to close off the mom's access to her fawn. Um, Moms do, fawns are known for their hider behavior, as we call it, where they just lie very, very still in an attempt to blend into the background, essentially, uh, while mom is off eating for the day. Uh, and that, until they are fully able to keep up with mom at high speeds, which happens, you know, shortly. It's not, it's only a matter of days to weeks before they can really travel with mom most of the time. Uh, essentially just leaving her access to that fawn is going to be very important. We wouldn't want to move the fawn or, or touch it in any way. The, we hear the stories about how sensitive the moms are to, to being able to pick up our scents on, mm -hmm. on fawns um, and 
potentially on what, you know, making that really tough decision that the smell of the predator near the fawn is, is, is a bigger concern than taking care of the fawn. So I would say just some patience, um, certainly keeping people and dogs and um, away for just a few more days would probably be the best solution. And if that doesn't resolve, going ahead and uh, going ahead and calling your state agency biologist and just letting them know if you're seeing anything persisting beyond that time. You would not want her to be taking possession essentially of that part of the yard and saying, okay, this is going to be my, my fawn raising nursery for a long period of time. Gotcha. Um, so another question. So Sherry um, has read about problems of overpopulation of deer. And so at, at which point do the wildlife management entities take that action? And I, I think you maybe touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, you cut out just a little bit. So I heard overpopulations of deer and which agency to contact. At, at what point do they take that action? Well, that is a, a good question to ask those wildlife managers in the agency. It may be that they have multiple competing requests. There may be some parts of the population asking them to reduce the population, uh, or the more vocal folks may in fact be on the leave the deer alone situation. And it may at that point be time to not only ask those wildlife management professionals for their assistance with the wildlife, but to talk about how to create a community conversation to make some of those choices. Um, they, there is no magic number of deer density at which point any agency is going to start managing by removals, uh, in part because uh, our tools for removing deer are fairly limited when we've got humans and their safety so close by. That concern is there, but an awful lot of it is the, the management of the social goals, uh, what people think is too much, what we call the social caring capacity. Um, so there's two questions about ticks. Okay. So Skip is in Oregon, and he's curious to know if deer ticks are a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, but then Douglas lives in Vermont, and so he's mm -hmm. curious about Lyme disease and the interaction with deer with ticks on deer, and is that an issue? Ticks in general um, are a concern, not just because of the the diseases or parasites that they pass from deer. Um, so I would say in both cases, are ticks a concern for humans? Yes, we, we would prefer not to be essentially swapping blood um, or really quite frankly spit in blood with a tick just because uh, there are quite a few other diseases besides dearborn diseases that can make us quite ill, very, very critically ill in some cases. Um, that is one of the, what I call an indirect health concern of increasing deer visitation to our yards and density as well, is that they inevitably do bring their parasites that which, uh, regardless of region ticks. Um, so are they a concern? Yes. Certainly in Lyme disease country, that is a, a significant concern. Um, interestingly, there are some animals, uh, such as possum, that are now ranging beyond what their really ge geographic range should have been that actually eat ticks. So it's kind of interesting how climate and human landscape changes and wildlife range changes are, are creating these um, interesting interactions. But in general, I would say that ticks... Uh, feeding on any other mammal especially and then feeding on a human being is a concern. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions came in. Um, so Linda, and I don't know, you might not know, be able to answer this one, um, but she has a question about composting with food scraps. 
Mm -hmm. Our way to to successfully compost, but you had mentioned that deer sometimes feed on apples and you know sure. other waste product. And so, um, how can you successfully compost if you know you have deer? Yeah, I would say running a really hot compost pile uh, is going to be the solution. Uh, you don't want them being able to come in and literally picking apples or, or any other green forage, uh, nutritional, uh, nutritious forage right off of a pile. So you may need to, to fence away from it, but I, I would think that a really hot pile is not going to be something that a deer necessarily would eat off of. In the wintertime, it might be something they might, might want to bed near because it'd probably be kind of warm, but... That's true. I didn't think about that. Um, Karen would like to know about some of those uh, deterrents, like fluttering ribbons and like windmill things. Does any of those work more than once? I, I would say that any of those things can work, uh, especially as they're new or novel. Uh, once the deer realize that nothing really bad happens to them and that they can eat un uninterrupted, they will habituate to it and begin to ignore it. Um, I don't know, I haven't had any experience with the fluttering tape, but I know that doing science type projects out with marking tape that deer love to eat that stuff. Um, so they are not at all deterred by it. And even though I can't imagine it having very much value, they'll chew on it. Um, Skip, I think it just had more of a comment uh, about deer just being really selective on the areas where they feed. And he noted that he had a bed of tulips and one year they ate all the yellow ones and left the red. <laughs> and so, and it was just this, Sorry. you know, stems left. They ate all the flowers off of that. Yeah. Um, so Sherry has a, another interesting question. She's wondering if anyone is working on oral contraception for deer to keep those populations down. Yeah, that is an interesting, um, not that I know of as far as an oral route. There are definitely uh, various contraceptives being tried. They're generally by injection, however, um, in part because you need to be able to give multiple doses and you need to be able to individually identify which animals have been treated and which have not yet been treated, um, things like that. So the concern with oral contraceptives is how you would offer the product in a way that nothing else could eat it. Uh, you wouldn't want your toddler to pick it up. You wouldn't want the neighbor's dog or your dog to eat it. You wouldn't certainly wouldn't want your chickens to eat it, things like that. So when we make oral baits, we have to be very, very, whether it's to contracept animals or to, to uh, lethally control them, we want to make sure that that bait is offered in a very species-specific manner. And it's hard to think about how we might do that for a deer. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia's uh, noting that deer ate, ate to the ground two feet of shrubs that she planted, and would they have had a better chance of survival if they were taller? I don't know uh, that range you mentioned, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think even if they were taller, the lower reaches probably would have gotten eaten. Um, it can be, shrubs tend to become more uh, deer proof the woodier they get. So it's not necessarily the height, it's, it's the growth, uh, but those growing ends, the growth tips are still always going to be the pieces that the deer wants to select for anyway. Um, so there you can see those otherwise healthy shrubs even where the interior looks quite good. It's just a little slimmer because all the growth tips have been eaten and then you end up with with the full size plant up above that. So uh, quite often protecting those plants until they reach a point to literally be armored uh, out is one, one situation you might consider. Right. Um, Nancy lives in, in Albany and she normally has been seeing deer year round, but she, her population in her area has diminished quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And she's just curious about, uh, wasting disease. I guess this is something in the coast range. I don't, I don't know much mm -hmm. about it if it's with deer or if it's another, um, 
referring to chronic wasting disease. Um, and that is, we could bring in an expert for a whole webinar on that alone. Um, that is a prion or a, it's a basically a brent, bent protein. It's, it's um, similar to the mad cow disease and it is of great concern to our game populations of deer and elk, uh, especially. So far, knock on, I'll find some wood to knock on here. We have not yet detected that in our wild deer in Oregon. Uh, it's getting closer. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's likely a matter of time. Uh, the first, I, I did read about the first case being detected in uh, southern Montana. So it's starting to move closer to us. I think in Oregon, especially in the, the western and coastal areas, um, a bigger concern would be the chewing lice. So the hair loss syndrome uh, comes from a non-native chewing louse that came in on non-native imported deer species. Uh, they can destroy the animal's hair coat to the point that winter survival, especially of the younger animals, of the stressed animals, of the older animals, that can be reduced and that could have some population level survival effects. Uh, most deer, we're learning, if they're in relatively good condition, they can get past that point. But that could be one factor. Uh, I'd be more also interested in learning about what other factors have changed on the landscape that's affecting the deer herd. Mute myself. Um, Lisa would like to know about, and I don't know how involved you are in this area, about um, urban planning and like wildlife corridor options, so like mm -hmm. designated areas. I know other states might do this um, at a statewide level, but. Yeah, I, I think large metropolitan areas are the ones that are probably leading the charge on a lot of this, uh, uh, debating between whether we should try to concentrate human habitations and leave bigger green space areas or whether we can maintain connectivity and essentially movement by animals of different species through our urbanizing areas. And there, I, I can't come down one way or the other on these. It's not an area of specialty for me. There are people who specialize in trying to think about these and test these designs. Uh, the one concern uh, doing what I do in terms of answering questions about uh, potential conflicts in, in, in the internet, that when we bring wild animals, especially large bodied ones in closer to proximity to humans and their activities, that uh, that can be a concern both for the animals and for the human beings. Uh, we have had some great movement corridor successes with major roads such as underpasses and overpasses um, and power line corridors to help them move, but those tend not to be in the high human density uh, neighborhoods. They tend to be uh, larger belts of green space. So that, that's a possibility, certainly. We need to find ways to keep populations connected. So fortunately, people are doing that work, try to figure out how we can do that for different species. Great. Um, and then there's just one last question, and then, then we'll um, kind of wrap it up. Um, so Skip was wanting to know about wolf populations uh -huh. and like this, uh, you know, shift to having wolves and allowing wolves and not, and that mm -hmm. made me think about where we've been having a lot of interaction with cougar populations that seem to be moving down and they may be attracted to the deer, right? And Absolutely. So, yeah. so, so deer habitat does uh, become habitat for those larger deer predators. Um, whereas the deer sees our plants as food, the, the large predators see deer as food. Um, and it's a contributing thing, it's an interacting thing. So I don't think that our cougars are, uh, for example, here in the, the built up parts of Western Oregon are necessarily just moving in because of the deer, but the deer are an opportunity as cougar numbers rebound from being um, more heavily controlled both by humans and by their competitors, which would have been wolves and bears back in the day.
a few different factors going on. I, I know that certainly in other states, wolves and deer are fully interacting along with deer and cougars. In fact, cougars are, are specialized to uh, prey on deer to the point that the space between their canine teeth fits almost perfectly to the, the neck size of a deer's uh, vertebra. So there's some cool interactions and deer is basically engineered to deal with those threats. That's why they've got those nice long light legs so that they can run. Great. Well, um, I really appreciate you joining us, Dana. We don't have the clapping, so there we go. Uh, thank <laughs> Part you. That's been a pleasure. Um, a yeah, so we'll be posting uh, the slides from this. You can review it. A recording will be coming out. Everyone that's here, you'll get a notification of that, some more of the resources as well. And then I hope that you join us at our next webinar next month talking about uh, safety in the garden, food safety in the garden. So thanks, everybody. And I'll just I'll put a link Thank in you. chat to the learn event. You probably got here via that. I've got a link to her uh, Dana slides that she used. There's a PDF version of there if you want to see that. And then there'll also be a link to the recording there too. Thank you. Thanks, folks. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.